Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. We toss out the screaming heads and put people before political parties and give context to the news to make you think. My name is Chris Spangle, and this is a special series on We Are Libertarians called The Swamp Explained. And my co-host is Rob Quartel, a 45-year fly on the wall in Washington, D.C., He's worked for Republican presidential campaigns, government agencies like the EPA, and has been confirmed by the Senate to the U.S. Federal Maritime Commission. He's also been a candidate for Congress and Senate, and given his experience and iconoclastic viewpoints, Rob gives us great insight into the swamp that makes up our, na our nation's capital. And, you know, most libertarians, which make up probably most of our listeners, don't really um, they like to dehumanize the swamp. And so one thing that we like to do here is explain the swamp, understand the swamp so we can dismantle it. And that first and foremost uh, begins with seeing uh, not, not as the enemy, but just people with different ideas than you. And so that's kind of what we talk about here. And that, that's going to be put to the test today, Rob. Uh, <laughs> yes. Because the first person that we're talking about, uh, we're going to talk about 9-11 and, and war and perpetual warfare, I'm sure, will come up. But, uh, you know, John Bolton was just fired, quit the administration. Uh, we've had a couple of these, uh, most notably happened with Roger Stone when during the campaign. He, Stone said, I quit. No, I fired him. Uh, John Bolton, it seems there has been tension with Bolton and Trump. Uh, John Bolton was the national security advisor, and uh, he, you know, there was a story out about a month ago where apparently just in front of everybody, Trump started putting Bolton down and said, you know, which, which, uh, which county in Ireland would you like to bomb next? Or you know, <laughs> kind of basically there's a lot of memes out there about how much John Bolton loves war and how much he wants to start wars, and he, uh, he is certainly a, a hawkish person. Yeah. Uh, and so when libertarians talk about John Bolton, to humanize John Bolton, it's, uh, I'm, being, I'm being completely scandalous right now on this podcast, Rob. You may not know. <laughs> uh, but, you know, let's start with John Bolton, the man himself. Do you know him at all, or do you know people no. around him? No, I, I don't know him, but I know a lot of people who know him. And, you know, he's... <laughs> he's, I, I actually thought it was a little odd that uh, Trump picked him. Uh, you know, he, I think he was auditioning for the job uh, on, uh, on the TV in defending the administration. But, you know, he's always been considered a very hardliner. He was in uh, the, the uh, George W. Bush administration. He's been in other Republican administrations. He's, uh, uh, he's a, a very smart guy. Um, he has a reputation for not suffering fools gladly, and fools would be those people who don't agree with him. Yes. And so, so the guy across the room, the, the guy with the orange top, might might have not liked being in that category. Um, uh, you know, it, I, what I find interesting at first, it's interesting that Trump hired him in the first place because Trump, remember, Trump said we were going to get out of all these wars. Yeah. And, and that he he won partly. Uh, with his base, because that, I think, you know, a lot of Americans uh, on what is the so-called populist side, really, um, they, they're kind of tired of these wars. They should be tired of these wars. You know, Afghanistan's going on for 17 or 18 years, and we still haven't won or solved it. Um, first of all, we don't put enough resources in it to do it, but we're unlikely to do that. And, um, and I, and that's, you know, that's a very American thing, to not like to be in wars. Remember, that's when we were founded. That's what we, we were trying to get away from being in foreign wars and entanglements and everything else, you know, so George Washington's final speech. So, it, it, so from that perspective, uh, Trump was speaking to um, a very, um, uh, a very American cr across many sectors and ideologies kind of point of view. And um, so it was kind of weird that he hired Bolton, but, you know, I'm sure he saw him defending him on TV, it lost uh, McMaster or one of them. I guess Bolton is his third guy to leave. Um, you know, the conversation in Washington today is that um, uh, Pompeo will uh, take on that role as not only as Secretary of State, but is also his National Security Advisor. And <laughs> it, it would not be the first time Henry Kissinger had that. Okay. 
uh, and uh, so it's it's certainly not uh, wrong. The problem is that, of course, the, the National Security Advisor is supposed to be uh, sort of like a conductor of the orchestra of foreign policy among all the intelligence agencies and the State Department and the aid agencies and the, and all of these things, and and to be a neutral uh, arbiter. And so I think it's a little hard for uh, it would be hard for Pompeo to do that. Uh, uh, you know, to be neutral and an arbiter. You know, Kissinger, of course, had a grand design for everything and Nixon with him. So uh, they were playing the whole game together. Um, but I, I suspect I would not be surprised if it went that way. Uh, you yeah. know, you know, we've got a guy running uh, running OMB who's also running the uh, one of the consumer agencies, Consumer Finance Protection Agent. I can't remember which one it is. CP, whatever. Yeah, the, the Warren Bureau. CFP something or other. Consumer <laughs> Financial Protection Bureau. Yeah, right. And uh, so he's doing two jobs, which I'm not sure is legal, but it's uh, clearly being done in this administration. And uh, maybe one, one might observe that Trump never ran an organization that had a span of control over about 10 people. So maybe that's what he's aiming for in the federal government. Yeah, his personal, I mean, he runs a small business. It's got a lot of, you know, assets and money. Right. But, I mean, right. it really was, in terms of people, he's now managing the largest organization on earth. And uh, boy, is he not doing uh, great at So th is that the well, origin? What do, you, do, do you, what do you know? What kind of historical perspective can you give on this position of National Security Advisor? You kind of touched on it briefly there, but um, any well, my, my, my recollection is that it was reorganized into the, uh, the National Security Advisor under uh, Nixon, who, you know, he basically set up a, a crew of people around him uh, at the White House handling kind of who were the puppet masters, they like to think, but they really weren't, um, uh, different agencies and groups of agencies. So if you go back to Nixon, who really was the architect of the modern government, and for the better, frankly, because he understood government and he wanted it to work. Um, and he, one day people will probably harken back to remember that. Um, you know, he had, um, he had Daniel Pat Patrick Moynihan as his domestic policy advisor. And, and Moynihan, who was a liberal Democrat, uh, came to Nixon's attention because he had written a book uh, on uh, the welfare state uh, and in which he, he made the point to the consternation of the left that the, the welfare programs actually um, were not lifting people from poverty. In fact, they were sort of holding them down, you know, and if, you know, the welfare mother uh, story, if you, if you actually got married, you would lose your child support, hmm. which wasn't exactly conducive to building families. And he wrote about the dissolution of the, of the black family and so on and so forth. And Nixon just thought he was Brilliant, and he brought him in, and and, and uh, I have a, a cousin who worked for him, cousin by marriage, and followed him to India. When Nixon got tired of him, uh, he he sent him to India as ambassador, uh, at, where he did a fabulous job and was, you know, to this day considered the greatest ambassador, along with uh, John Kenneth Galbraith from the Democratic side. But uh, but so Nixon wanted to have uh, actually he wanted to have super agencies, and I can't recall. Which uh, what the you know which how they had put put them together or what his plan was it never happened but but he did consolidate agencies and and that was pretty important and so all of this stuff in the White House trying to manage the messaging and managing the policy most of that originated in Nixon uh, and of course Kissinger understood all the apparatus of government as did Nixon so that made a lot of sense um, and there have been good people in that and bad people and. You know, uh, so over the years now, I, I will, the other thing I find really amusing about Bolton resignation or firing or whatever it was uh, uh, is that uh, it, it, people who should be happy are, are making a big deal out of it uh, as if they're not happy and people who are not happy are making a big deal of it as if they were happy. And so, you know, the, the, the left, um, which should be happy about it, uh, because he is he is a hawk. Uh, 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 he, I think someone compared him to a neocon, um, you know, a Scoop Jackson neocon, but he's really as he is a Republican. Um, and, yeah, uh, that was uh, what's his name? Who's the who's the little guy with the bow tie on TV? Uh, 
Oh, Tucker. Tucker Carlson. Yeah, right. Tucker Carlson went apoplectic. He said he was really a leftist or something. <laughs> well, he is. He is part of the 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 Bush. I mean, the Bush foreign policy, which is pretty Not much Tucker. Woodrow Wilson's Woodrow Wilson's foreign policy. He, he was his UN ambassador. Right. He yeah. has advocated for regime change in Iran, Syria, Libya, Venezuela, Cuba, yeah, right. Yemen, and North Korea. Yeah. You know, he supported the invasion of Iraq. He continues to support military intervention in Syria, Libya, Libya Iran. Like he rejects being called a neocon, but right. in terms of the Bill Crystal, um, w- w- Paul Wolfowitz, I believe, right, right, right. The architects. I mean, in terms of the he, continuation, he like them. yeah. I mean, he That's he right. fits directly into yeah. that mold. And, and so, well, and go back to to Bush. This was George W. Bush. Remember, yeah. uh, he very specifically ran on a platform of not um, yeah. not undertaking regime change. Um, and, and all of these guys, when they come in, of course, they're faced with very different problems. They don't actually know what the problems are when they're running. Right. So, so someone who does, like a George H.W. Bush, uh, even someone like him, uh, he, he was, you know, he said it was, you, you really can't know how hard this is unless you're there in that very seat. Yeah. Okay? And even if you sit next to the guy doing it day after day. And, uh, but the, I think people are faced with, exigencies and very different realities than they in theory would like to believe. But, you know, the, the DC contingent, you got the people you know, bleeding all over Trump because he's gotten rid of a guy who they didn't like in the first place and who they complained about when he hired him because he is a, uh, he is a hardline guy. Um, and then uh, you, you've got other guys who on the Republican side, well, you, your guy, Ron Paul, right? And not Ron Paul, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, you know, was of course delighted because he, he didn't want to get involved in any foreign wars either. So um, that's the that's the interesting thing about Trump, and that was one of the alluring things about Trump for a lot of libertarians. Which a foundational portion of libertarianism is being anti-war. It's it's yeah. it's the, the the book Crisis of Leviathan by I think it's Higgs basically documents the growth of the federal government and executive power in wartime. And that's what expands over the course of American history. Um, you know, it just is the justification. You look at, you look at, we're ce- well, we're not celebrating the 18th anniversary of 9-11 yesterday. This is September 12th, 2019. And it's a, the 18th anniversary, which means that if you were born on September 11th, 2001, you now can, you, you could in se- at 17, but there's, there's soldiers now who are serving in Afghanistan who were not alive That's for, right. for 9-11. It's, it's, a for, it's called the forever war. It's the longest war in American history. And if you look at the, the realities of the Afghan war, the Iraqi war, like there, there's just a continual presence of Amer- the American military around the globe and I think Americans are largely tired of it if they pay attention to it. And the Bush doctrine of we're going to spread freedom to these countries is just patently false when ISIS and Iran now control, you know, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan. Well, I, I'm, I, I'm not so sure. that I, I really don't think that was the fundamental reason that we went into those wars or, or most other wars, for that matter. Most of okay. it has to do with the perception of what you need to do to protect yourself first, and then it's all got dressed up, and you know it's, it's lipstick on a pig to say it's to to, to uh, bring freedom and liberty to everybody else. And now um, there is, as you well know, a lot of um, of uh, academic and real world research that shows that democratic states tend to be less warlike, mm-hmm. uh, but they also have a harder time organizing uh, depending on the environment. And you know this this country is pretty unique. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, and uh, uh, in that respect, in fact, um, the founders of this country worried in the um, in the 1820s and 30s, what would they do um, as we got bigger and bigger? Could they manage the population that spread across all these geographies? And then they didn't have time zones per se. And and then along came the telegraph at about the time we hit the West Coast. And um, that was the, the telegraph was viewed as a great unifier. Uh, that would make us all be able to have the same information um, all the time and at the same time. So we 
could make the same deliberate, brilliant decisions that we always have made throughout our history. But, um, but so, so you know, Bush, um, you know, the, the, around 9/11, the, the whole the issue there was how do you go after the um, the Taliban? And they, at the time, were the government. Remember some of the things that happened prior to that. Remember they they blew up, uh, destroyed one of the oldest uh, man statues on the planet. Um, at the time, that, which outraged, you know, cultural anthropologists and art historians and everybody else, as well as many Afghans. But um, so they were already on the radar for a number of other things. But um, and and the question is today, what are you going to do? Well, the Taliban was created, many would argue, by the U.S. CIA in order to fight the Russians, who then occupied Afghanistan and were eventually kicked out. Um, you know, it's sort of you, you you reap what you sow sometimes, um, and and they them they like to compare themselves in a way to the to the Vietnamese in in, uh, in uh, you know the 60s and 50s 60s and early 70s uh, from the north who were simply in their mind trying to create their own unified country and kick out the colonial barbarians. But um, here we so so what do you do? You know if we leave. Um, leave them high and dry. I, I think probably even with 8,000 troops, that's the equivalent of leaving them high and dry, and it's not enough really to protect ourselves. Uh, and I, I, I think there are not a lot of things that will uh, uh, hold hold them back. Uh, yeah, but at the same, that's a different discussion, you know. Right, but at the same time, I mean, there's there's not much of a good solution in terms of staying there and it does remind me of the choice in that nixon and kissinger had to make in vietnam which you can yeah. inform us younger listeners like myself i've only seen a documentary um but they they faced a very similar choice where it was very clear that they weren't going to quote unquote win they're never even in the earliest days of kennedy there was no idea of what victory could look like McNamara and the papers the Pentagon papers kind of exposed all that that there was never necessarily a vision for victory but now you've got this state in South Vietnam that is corrupt and wholly awful but your alternative is the the communists and communist influence and so what do you do do you leave and and what what happened after we pulled out of Vietnam in South Vietnam I mean I don't know how familiar you are with that but I mean, are there, there seems to me to be parallels between our choice in Afghanistan and Iraq and with Vietnam. Well, there, there, you know, the the interesting there there is an interesting piece of the communist ideology which separates it from many of the religious ones and others, which is they at least in theory and and pretty much in practice. Um, um, have a system in which they they actively act as if they believe men and women should and are equal in places like the workplace and education and all of that and in all of those systems they believe in in uh, education uh, obviously it's an ideological component to it uh, but when the uh, and and the other thing that was going on at the time of Vietnam was that these were proxy wars so uh, you know you had China on the one side and Russia on the other, and and uh, sometimes the two of them came into conflict about whose proxy was whom whose, and so um, Vietnam was a very kind of different thing. I think the problem with the the these uh, conservative religious ideologies that we see in the Middle East, and um, and and you know there are other political ideologies like that, is that they really you don't even have the form of the democratic um, ideologies. So th there's a big difference, you know. Um, the, the North Vietnamese uh, were basing it on a Marxist-Leninist kind of liberation uh, ideology, and it, it was, you know, the roots are in Western culture. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and there was statecraft. And, and the, that's right. There was statecraft. There was everything. And Taliban is not. And and in fact, when the you know the, the the North Vietnamese were ruthless, they won. They had one goal. They didn't. They, they were happy to lie and do whatever they had to. And I suspect Nixon and Kissinger knew what would happen. They just sort of hoped it would not. And it took a little bit of time, but of course it happened in in uh, 
Jerry, President Gerald Ford's administration, and you know, those of us who were around then re remember uh, all of the people fleeing. Uh, and in fact, one of the great restaurant tours in Washington, D.C. is uh, Jermaine Swanson was brought out on the last plane, uh, last not last helicopter, off the rooftop of the American embassy um, as they were all being overrun. And, and uh, the guy who got her out he was a, uh, was a, uh, I think he was a National Geographic photographer, and he, he and they later married. And uh, she later started uh, one of the first uh, high-end Vietnamese restaurants in Washington, D.C., Germain's. And uh, uh, that was an introduction that many of us had for the first time to really, really good uh, Asian food, yeah. you know. So anyway, she doesn't have that now, but she's she does cater. She's terrific. <laughs> that may be my restaurant review in retrospect today. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know, both and all of that. It's uh, uh, I think I think the main things that I, I am seeing, and I sus suspect you are too, is you know Trump's instincts that he does talk about is he does not want to fight. Um, you know, fighting is a, a little bit of a sign of failure. Uh, to a bully, <laughs> yeah, bullies, don't, don't, bullies don't want to fight. They that's just, a good. That's a good point. And I hadn't thought about it in terms of that because I think he knows he doesn't want to pick a fight. He knows he can't win, and so his his foreign policy views do seem more in line with Rand Paul's worldview than Lindsey Graham or oh, John Bolton's. Well, and they're much, and they're, yeah, they are, and and they're not centrist. Although you know you can't be in Washington and you can't be dealing with these issues without picking up some of the nuances over time of yeah. uh, what's going on. And of course, he's had to learn a lot of history uh, fairly quickly. So, so I personally, I think it's great that Bolton's gone. I'm, I'm not surprised. I had to laugh at Pompeo's reaction when he was asked if he was surprised and he said, never. <laughs> no. And, and, uh, uh, and then of course he went on to sort of dither around the fringe and what he said, said, you know, president deserves people around him who agree with him well or who he's comfortable with and i it's hard to disagree with that either you know and and of course you, um, now the other thing that again this is where you have the contradictions between the establishment and the media and what they say and what they do and what they believe so um you know all of us believe the president should get kind of unvarnished opinions um from a variety of views and of course they they run it through their own filters and ideologies, and they'll come up with their answers based on that. Um, so you, you have, we have now lost the guy, Bolton, who has a very substantially different view than a lot of people in Washington about the tactical things you should be doing in response to Iran and Afghanistan and all of these other hotspots. So there was a piece recently about the foundation of this new think tank with Soros and the Koch brothers. They're starting an anti-interventionist think tank, and it stood out because most of the think tanks in Washington, D.C. were started because they push the idea of intervention, or a lot of them are funded by defense contractors to push policy that puts money in their pockets. Um, and so the establishment of a new think tank that is going to be backed by two very substantial left and right donors can, can actually have some substantial power. You have that combined with the conversation about America's waning influence across the region, you know, starting with Bush, continuing under Obama, and obviously the, the, um, the recklessness of an indecision of Trump doesn't help the hands-off approach of Obama and the aggression of Bush. It's like it's been a long 20-year slide of American influence around the globe because, let's face it, there was a, there, it's the Frank, Francis Fukuyama paper that was released right. uh, basically saying... The end of, end of history. End of history. Liberal democracy has won. It's defeated communism. And democracies did grow over time, but they're now shrinking. You've got more autocracies pop, popping up. They're... Um, Francis Fukuyama's new book about identity. I think he covers a lot of the things that he missed and it wasn't aware of. And so you now do have sort of um, the, the lessening of America on the world stage, be that good or bad, but there is it. And so my question is that is John Bolton, the last of a certain type that we're going to see in Washington, DC as 
policymakers move away from Wilsonianism, which is basically intervention in foreign affairs to influence those nations on American ideals? Or is this period right now just sort of a respite before we move back and America becomes, you know, uh, more interventionist again? Or did, did Iraq really just end the idea that America is the moral force for good and can influence these countries to institute liberal democracy? So, so there are a couple of different things uh, that you have to unwrap in what you've just been saying. One is, um, I, I think I would disagree that America is still not the most influential country on the planet. Um, you know, it is certainly from a social standpoint, every kid in, in China or Russia or Taiwan or, uh, you know, or Mexico or whatever plays America. Hong Kong, and I, and I don't mean to say yeah. that we're not. I'm saying Think that about they- Hong Kong. Yeah, Hong Kong is waving the American flags. Like the ideal right. of America is very strong, even although, if very although I think they're way. I actually am a little suspicious of waving the flags over there. I suspect, I, my my, I, I don't want to believe it, but I I suspect that the Chinese government um, yeah. planted people with those flags so that they could say it was an American influenced uh, demonstration and which, use which they are saying, yeah. Right? Yeah, which they would use as a pretext for invasion. So mm. I'm not uh, quite sure, but but they do look to the U.S. for support, and and I think people are constantly disappointed when we do not provide it. So that's that's one thing. And if you think about immigration uh, itself, we are still where everybody wants to come, and they want to come because people on the outside still believe the American ideal, even if we understand ourselves that everything doesn't. You know that we we're not as mobile as we used to be and uh, and we still suffer from too heavy mortgages and everything else so people can't sell their house and move and things like that so but so I think I think most people on the outside believe in the larger American dream as I think do most Americans when they're not worried about the day-to-day -day. Um, the and or intellectualizing it um, on the issue of wars though um, again, it comes down to um, a desire to control your own fate. Um, so uh, do you want to just sit there while uh, terrorist cells, uh, you know, bomb your friends and allies or sit there while they send people on airplanes over to see us and run into the two World Trade Center towers, which is essentially, you know, what happened. And we were not dealing with that issue at the time. And so... Um, it, it, you know, do you give money? Do you give education? What do you do? And so I, I think we're not in a world any longer where we can we can be disengaged. So you're, I mean, to your point about we don't want wars, maybe we don't want wars, but maybe sometimes the way to prevent a war is to actually have a war, or or have people on the ground or do these other things. And you know, it's all fraught. It's got lots of a lot of difficulties and layers here that are you can't always win it so yeah and but i will say we back into an awful lot of wars right and so that's why i wonder if bolton is just the last of that type and america is moving its its public is just a man demanding a new direction so we'll have to see i mean there's no shortage of uh of military contractor money out there that'll advertise on or yeah. support, you know well i don't think they have as much influence at that level as as you might want to think on the outside they you know, they clearly influence budget okay. and, and most of their very little of their money in reality goes to influencing public opinion, except as to the general image of the companies, you know, the patriotic, the planes flying and the soldiers relying on their equipment and all those things. But most of their money really goes to to a very practical <laughs> outcome, which is to influence the spending. And, right. and you could argue that, of course, influencing spending influences foreign policy because if you build planes and trains and planes and aircraft carriers, you got to do something with them. And of course, the argument is, if you have them, you might never have to do anything with them. Uh, yeah. Do you think? The hope. Well, Certainly, that's the hope. Right. Do you think the congressman from Dayton's going to argue against new planes? I mean, nope, 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 nope. No, not at all. So, uh, uh, although although he he probably should worry about the price of that new plane. Yeah. So. <laughs> you mentioned um, kind of the buildup and, and some of the, the activities that go ahead. And you mentioned uh, what we've watched in the movie or read in the book in Charlie Wilson's war, the support of the Mujahideen against communism in right. Afghanistan. Um, there's another great book, and it's a great television series, too. I don't know if it's on Hulu or Amazon called The Looming Tower, but the book is <clears throat> phenomenal. 
Uh, and it documents a lot of, and Ali Soufan's great book, who was the, um, who, who was the kind of the Arabic translator in the middle for the FBI of, of the coal bombing and a lot of other incidents. Uh, great, great books, all of them. If you want to understand kind of the lead up to 9-11 and how all that happened, those are two fantastic books. But, um, you know, we, we look at the 18th anniversary of 9-11 yesterday. Um, so I wanted, to talk, I wanted to talk about it because you always have fascinating stories. So I'm sure just where you were and what you were doing and who you talked to in the days after 9-11, I'm sure would be fascinating uh, so, so where were you, what were you doing and what kind of happened? What's your, what's your nine 11 story? Uh, that's, it's, uh, probably like a lot of people in Washington. I was, uh, I got on a plane, uh, on the morning of nine 11 to fly to the West coast. And, uh, my wife had, had flown out the day before she was then head of, uh, discovery channel retail stores and was visiting the store and they were having a, uh, a meeting of all the staff out there. So she had gone the day before and I left that morning and I had actually not seen my kids that morning. We had a live in nanny at the time and, um, and she got them to school and everything else. And um, as we, uh, I was going to change planes in Chicago. And as we approach the stewardess says, well, we're not leaving. Uh, there's been a big accident uh, in the world trade center and a plane hit the tower and of course everybody began speculating and uh, I remember getting off the plane and hearing that as I'm getting off I'm seeing all of the monitors around showing the plane flying into the tower and I was carrying one of these gigantic clunky cell phones hmm. and kind of my reaction was oh cripes uh, I may be stuck here and I literally called Amtrak and uh, after quite a, a wait and several times, I got through and I reserved a train uh, from Chicago down to Washington, D.C. for that evening. And, uh, and then um, uh, a little bit you know, later, of course, it kept getting delayed, and, but I paid, had paid for it on, you know, on the phone and this and that. And, um, and then as I was standing there, I saw the second plane hit. And then everybody knew this was not an accident. Uh, and, you, you know, you, everybody was shocked. And, of course, talking about it. And shell shock is what they were. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I got uh, on the – I managed to get myself to the train station and onto the train. And, and, uh, um, uh, and of course, you're getting snippets of information as you go. And, and uh, uh, the TV, by then, you know, they sort of knew it was probably a terrorist attack. And uh, it took something like 18 hours to get back to Washington because the train had to stop everywhere. Uh, and it was, it was stopped by other trains being pushed back and all of that. And I finally got there. But while I was at the airport before I left to get to the train station, I tried to call um, my, my uh, wife uh, who was in California and I could not get the hotel. And then I, I tried six or eight times to call home uh, to get hold of the uh, nanny, and um, uh, and I finally did and told her that I was fine. That and she knew I was on a plane to California. Yeah. And um, and, um, and she went to the school. My kids went to a private school uh, in Northern Virginia, and so she and they completely locked it down. There were a, a, any number of people on those planes or in the Pentagon who had kids at this school, and um, and uh, uh, the um, um, and I remember my daughter, who then must have been about, let's see, she's thirty-five, so that's four. That's uh, she would have been eighteen. She would have been at seventeen, sixteen or seventeen, and my son was three years younger. Um, they apparently found her in class and said. And of course, the classes are seeing all this now. And she said they told her they, they couldn't tell them anything before that. And they came in to tell her that I was OK. And mm. she told me later she burst in tears and uh, uh, because she she sort of knew I was going to California and she knew her mother was in California. And yeah. but, uh, you know, not connecting the dates or any of that. 
And, um, and then I finally, I finally got hold of my wife um, at the hotel. And I said, I'm, I'm fine. And I'm in Chicago. And she said, Oh, that's great, dear. And we, we not we, quite the burst into tears. Uh, no, no. And um, I had forgotten it was, uh, it was by then about 930 on the East Coast and 630 on the West Coast. And she had not seen the news. You're kidding me. And she and I said, I'm fine. I got a race for the train. And I said, I'll catch up with you later. And she as she tells it, she and of course, all these events, think about human events, they're always two sides and other people and their versions are, they intersect in a slightly different. But she said, you know, she went on down to breakfast with one of the guys who worked for her. And he, he said, did you hear about the what happened? And she said no, and he ex he explained about it, and she said she was horrified, and she then understood why I said I was okay. So she didn't and, know about it till the next morning, September twelfth. Oh, that morning, it was that morning. She got up. She was asleep when I called it. Oh, okay. Remember, okay. it was, I think it was, uh, it was probably around six or six thirty, or she was getting dressed, got so it. she had not seen the news, and. Um, and then she went down without seeing the news and she sat down and the guy uh, who she was having breakfast with had seen it all. So, so, you know, that, so her side of that was that. And then for her, it was uh, tragic actually, because one of her young employees uh, had come from Boston and had taken, had been a one flight and changed onto the flight that ended up going in, you know, being destroyed by the, in the tower. So she lost an employee and knew that within, you know, probably a couple hours. And, and that was quite sad for all of those folks. And then, of course, the, I had a business partner who was stuck out in California. Uh, and uh, he was, you know, they all hoped the planes would, you know, they grounded all the planes uh, for, for day, several days. And, of course, everybody's hoping they'll get up, but they did not. And so people were scrambling for rental cars and trains and buses and, and um, you know, I, by some point I was back in Washington 18 or 20 hours later. Um, and when I arrived, I, I uh, well, let me finish the story about my business partner was stuck out there with several others and they, after a day, were finally able to locate a car, a yeah. rental car, and they drove back from California to uh, the East Coast. And of course, that took them several days to do that. Um, so, you know, I'm sure he would have a whole nother set of stories, and he did. Um, the uh, but as we returned to Washington, I remember the taxi. I, I lived up um, Nebraska Avenue near uh, Fox Hall, and which is a you know it's a nice section. It goes up, but it goes along the canal and the waterfront in Washington, and. So you go, as you drive from National Airport, you cross the 14th Street Bridge, and then you're all the way, you're along the waterfront, meandering all the way up to Georgetown, and then up from Georgetown, up up the uh, River Road, and up the uh, Canal Road, rather, and, and on up. And there were um, anti-tank weapons all along the way, and soldiers all around the White House and that area, and tanks everywhere. and uh, and um, uh, there was an anti-missile battery somewhere along the way, I recall. And, uh, you know, it was really stunning and uh, very dark, very, very dark. And yeah, I think it's hard because, you know, I've got several friends who are closer to 30 than 20 now. And they were in elementary school and like they know their parents reacted strongly to it. I, I turned 18 two days. I turned 18 on 9-9-2001. Wow. I signed up for selective service on the 10th. Mm. 9-11 was very traumatic for me because yeah, I thought, yeah. you know, much like you said, oh my God, I'm going. Uh, <laughs> being drafted. You know, I mean, it's, it's not like the slow trickle of Vietnam. I mean, this was just traumatic. And it's hard to explain to, to people who are 25 now what the world was like. I'm very fortunate that I got to know the world as somewhat of an adult before 9-11 because it is, it really is like a pre and post. Everything changed and there's so many things in your story that just jog in my memory. You know, I lived by the airport here in Indianapolis and it was just constant flight traffic and just a week of just silence was eerie. The, the, the trying to call anybody, even in Indianapolis that day, the, 
the phone lines were jammed. The landline, oh, terrible. cell lines, terrible. every gas station was out of gas in Plainfield, Indiana. Uh, now, there, wasn't, there was actually some cause for concern. We have the largest Muslim denomination is based in Plainfield, right. and yeah. there's, so there were security concerns and paranoia around that. And Of course, they were, they were stunned, equally stunned and shocked. Absolutely. My, and my friend, terrified for themselves. Yeah. My friend Musa Saeed's a famous movie documentarian now. He writes, he works at Harvard. Like he's a, he's a big wig. Uh, and his dad ran Isna and went to the White House and was part of that moderate Muslim coalition that kind of spoke up. And, and I saw people who uh, had known Musa and Isa since their childhood kind of turn on those guys and go, what are you hiding in your mosque? I mean, it was very sad, but I think, it, I think just part of the trauma of that day was the closure of everything, the inability to make phone calls, landing, oh, yeah. being grounded, just the complete paralysis of the country, along with that night, the news reporting 20,000 people may be lost. Like there, yeah. It's really hard to explain both that day, but also the world before, where you could get on a plane easily. You didn't have to take your shoes off. There was right. way... No ID. Just the idea, seeing the news reports of tanks in your nation's capital terrified me to no end it just it i can't imagine being a resident driving by an anti-missile battery i mean it really was scary no it was and of course there were planes flying all around um uh, mil you know military aircraft uh, you know and helicopters up and down the river and of course you know once these things happen you get the pentagon is activated and all of the support services that come with it and the helicopters and it's just a constant kind of churn um, and, and of course, everybody in D.C. knew somebody uh, who was killed. Um, you know, I uh, one of my later clients was uh, uh, the Office of Naval Intelligence. Well, the plane of the Pentagon flew right into their office and, and wiped half of those people out. And uh, one of my later good friends um, uh, turns out he had let he had come in late or was coming in later, left the office or something. So he wasn't even around that day. And, he might have been wiped out. I had another friend in the, the uh, who worked in the World Trade Center, and um, he happened to be late that day, so he was not there. I and of course for me, um, you know, I have given many many speeches around the country about one thing or another, and I had given uh, at least two. I think it was three speeches in the, in the upper reaches of the World Trade Center, uh, and uh, not uh, and maybe. Not six months earlier, my wife and I had gone up and had drinks at the at the bar at the top there, which had a fabulous view, of course. Um, and so you you can't help but think about, um, you know, what if I had been there? Or and today I think about, well, I was there uh, and I saw those buildings and they were great buildings and 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 that's an experience that that you will not have and no one born after that will have either. It's it's. So it, it's a piece of history that is both wiped out and a piece of history that is now created uh, in that. And uh, so, you know, you, you, you run into people and, and, you know, we just about everybody knew somebody who, you know, or one degree separation from somebody who died if you were in Washington. And, um, and of course, you know, there were some really big tech executives uh, uh, and uh, other people, just sort of everyday people on those planes. And, and of course, the other thing is you sort of ask yourself, how would I have reacted? Um, and uh, would, would I or you or would we have jumped up and, and you know, thrown stuff at the guy with the, the knife or the gun standing there? Or would we have uh, obeyed or whatever? And I suspect that, I suspect that most people did what would do what most of those people on those planes probably did, which is when they realized what was happening, they did something. You know, yeah, I mean, the, but, uh, the, the the idea I think is that the on flight ninety three Beamer and the rest of them, the less roll guy. I mean, it's uh, that that they crashed that plane so it wouldn't hit the White House or or Capitol building. I mean, they're uh, of course they were the White House had prepared to shot, shoot it down. You know, the they, okay. they've come back up with a new uh, a new recording in the last uh, week of uh, interview with, with Dick Cheney in which um, I think essentially he relayed the order that they were to shoot it down. I have heard that before, uh, and, yeah. And if, uh, and you know, it, 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 again, you have to put yourself in the circumstances of the person there. It's really hard to, you really cannot legitimately second guess it unless it 
uh, unless you can actually place yourself in those circumstances. And uh, but but a lot of things obviously changed. I mean, you know, within as soon as the airport was open, uh, I had a I had a trip. I had to go, and and actually I went with uh, my uh, number two guy who was is an Indian American, and he had he had a beard at the time, and um, they looked at him at the gate, and and it's like, are you? And he grew up in Indiana, and and they they uh, said, are you Indian? And he said, no, I'm American. They said, where are you from? He said, Indiana. <laughs> and it's and it was you know it was just sort of this um, kind of funny, quirky thing that would never have happened before. And yeah, he actually shaved off his beard at some point because he didn't want to be, you know, categorized visually. But you know, the other thing we forget are the things that that George uh, W. Bush did. Um, he, like everyone, he was pretty shell shocked, I would say. And there are many, there are probably things he could have done leading up to it, but I doubt it. Um, but one of the most important things he did, which distinguished him from um, the kind of president that he and Bill Clinton and George H.W. Bush and Ronald Reagan and, and Obama and all these other people are, and the predecessors to Trump, is that he went to the mosque on Massachusetts Avenue and made the point of, of making the point that this was not Muslims who did this. This was terrorist radicals who happened to be that, and that he did not want American Muslims or Muslims anywhere to be uh, painted in the, in the same as these guys. And, and you know that, frankly, that's in the tradition of George Washington. One of the first things he did was to go to uh, uh, both a Jewish temple and a Muslim uh, place. And he, he, he mentioned both in, and including non-believers in his, his uh, uh, the things he wrote in the documents and speeches, as did all of the founders. So, uh, you know, it, so this is, uh, that was a very distinct period of history in that respect too. And then they went on, but I, I, I think getting on planes, for me, the worst thing was th these, the TSA, taking your, your shoes off and, the, and I it just used to piss me off every time I go to the airport, which and I was there a lot because you had to take your shoes off and walk on this slip, slimy floor that no one cleaned. And they, they had no idea what was on it. And, um, and of course, they didn't have any real reason then to make you take your shoes off because they didn't have the liquid stuff. But um, right. uh, it, it certainly did. You must, you must have pre-check because us plebs I still do not. I you do don't. not. Okay. I, I don't for two reasons. One is I actually think if you were trying to uh, – to uh, insert yourself into the American system, you would do it through pre-check. Hmm. You would do it through a sleeper. Um, and um, so I think it actually makes us less safe. Yeah. But I object to the fact that if everybody gets pre-checked, the only people who will not have it are little old ladies who seldom fly and uh, poor people. And I just, uh, you know, I'm a, a egalitarian Republican. Just a man of the people. Man of the people. And I think it's just wrong. And of course, the irony is I get it almost every time I go anyway. Uh, and because you know, I actually have clearances that somehow somebody probably sees. So, uh, but I get pre checked almost every time I go and I'm not a member. Uh, yeah. And one time I, yeah, but I, I object to it, you know, in principle. But I, I know why they do it. I object to it. I, I always thought the same thing. Like it seems like that would make us more vulnerable. But, but I used to get in trouble all the time with the t with my my family, <laughs> even to this day, will not uh, go into the same line I'm in because the odds are I'm going to file a complaint against some TSA agent or complain about something. And I'm I'm always polite. And although at one point some TSA agent didn't like it, and she threatened to call the police <laughs> if, if I didn't go sit down and <laughs> whatever it was. But uh, but. Uh, uh, you know, I've probably filed so many complaints about their behavior and rudeness. And that's and one I, of those little signs that you're a libertarian is hating yeah, them and fighting with them. That's like yeah. that and a Star Wars bumper sticker means you're practically a member of the party. <laughs> well, you know, I, I really believe public servants should be polite. I, I used to, you know, some some wise ass public servant would do something to be. And I, and I always used to like say, well, wait, who do you think you work for? And they 
look at me like, whatever. And I say, you work for me. And they say, no, I work for John so-and-so. I say, no, I'm the taxpayer. So I pay John and I pay you. And I pay more than most. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so I, I, uh, they, they actually have, they actually gotten their act together better in the last couple of years. I will say they. We're still doing the stupid shoe thing. I, I, I don't know. know why. I one, know. And I, one guy in Detroit they, ruined and it. And Mark orders too, you know. And I really that I find irritating. I, I today more often than not, I'll, someone will bark an order and I'll say, "Try please." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it really just is. And look at you dumbfounded. <laughs> it's the principle of the government, the federal government, is touching your body. Like it's the only time in most of our lives that regular your stuff. Your stuff. It just everything. Your junk, it's junk. I guess it is right. <laughs> you know, one thing, if it's a private organization, but I don't know. There's, I'm with you. You know, one thing about that. You know, you're coming off of the Clinton impeachment. You're coming off the divisive 2000 elections. Yeah. And then you have on September 12th, uh, not, it wasn't for show. It was like a genuine outpouring where all the members of Congress come out and sing. Uh, now, now we all looking back, as we talked about in our Homeland Security episode, when all the politicians are in agreement, that's when you know you're going to start losing <laughs> rights. <laughs> but there was a sense, and this is maybe the only time in my entire life, because I was 18, and it's just been downhill ever since. <laughs> it's the only time where I felt a sense like George Bush is my president. This is my country. I love, lo right. you know, we're all in this together. That, that sense of a large communal belonging, you know, no matter how many times Barack Obama tried to say, you know, we're all in this together. It's like I never, I never had that connection that I had with Bush in those days afterwards. And I think that it's hard to explain to an 18-year-old now what a moment of true bipartisanship or belonging, not bipartisanship. I mean, I just think everybody in those days afterwards, we were on the same page. And that's right. the last time that I really feel like we were on the same page. Well, and, 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 but again, some of that, yes, I agree with you. And, and I, but as you're saying this, I'm, I was thinking about there's certain, there certain moments that make you feel good mm -hmm. um, and, and proud of being an American. So for example, uh, what actually flashed through my, Head, as you were saying that, is John McCain, uh, the night of the election, when he knew he had lost and had called Obama, and instead of going out and crying about unfairness and everything else, he said, I am so proud to be an American for what we have done tonight. And of course, he was referring to the fact that we had elected the first African American and sort of gotten over some of these biases. So I, I agree with you on that. I had the same when Obama walked out on the stage in Chicago. That was a moment when I was proud of America for uh, having studied civil rights, getting to a place where we would elect a black person president of the United right. States. Like, I, I, do, I do agree with you. That was one moment for me as well. Yeah, and, and McCain making the point of it is yeah. even all the more interesting given the politics. So, but, um, but, uh, you know, there. I, I think, of course, once you start talking policy, that's when the rubber beats the road. And of course, within days, <coughs> we began the debates over, you know, what to do and 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 would we strike? Would there be a war? Um, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, pre and preparations for retaliation, which didn't happen immediately, as you you know, yeah. um, and was well well thought out in that respect. Um, and then. Uh, um, and then, of course, th that whole retaliation got uh, uh, kind of co-opted by the go after Iraq as well. Um, <clears throat> and then um, and then the creation of the department. But, you know, if you just think about, for me, the, the most negative consequence of all of this uh, is a real loss of um, individual liberties, civil liberties, um, uh, that are under a threat in all sorts of ways. And I, you know, I have said to many people, I, I am less anxious about Amazon or Google or anybody else having my data. I don't particularly like it, but I am absolutely petrified of the U.S. government having it. And yeah. it's not because I don't trust my government or the people in it. Uh, I know the the, the law enforcement people at you know, the federal level are very cognizant of what the, the line is, and, and more so, obviously, than the president many times. Uh, and they're careful about that because they're professionals. 
but um, uh, it's, you know, there's this line and, uh, you know, the debate now is on uh, uh, facial recognition technology, how much should you allow it for law enforcement or cameras and so on and so forth. And, and I cannot help but think back to when I was younger than you, but not much, when the Soviet Union was a major threat and you had East Germany and the Stasi, Stasi and people reporting on each other and, and, and uh, everybody had to have identification. And we used to sort of thumb our nose and joke about that, you know, as communists, but you know, we do all the same kind of thing. And we, we talk about, um, uh, we, we talk about the Chinese and, and their, what they do. And the reality is it's, it's kind of a matter of degree. Uh, <laughs> when and, Trump is saying we're going to use your Alexa to <clears throat> see if you can keep your gun through red flag laws, it's like who amongst us hasn't have a, had a fight with a significant other or right. you know, once you gather all kind, every piece of data, all you have to do is have a narrative, go back and find the data points to prove your theory, and you can make anybody look any way you want. And that's really the danger of it, of the mass collection. We, we ought to really do an episode on that, because with your tech background, yeah. I'd be... Well, and, and you know, the, the illustration of the, of the dilemma uh, uh, between, you know, when the Chinese execute somebody, they always say they were executed in accordance with the law. <laughs> so, and, uh, but there was, there's an insurance company at IC, um, and I won't name the company, but um, the fellow doing it uh, sits in the middle of the road and he says, he offers that if you allow the insurance company to put you on this program, we will monitor your driving and we'll get you better rates. Um, of course, what it will really do is get you worse rates <laughs> because, you know, right now you're probably, uh, there's, a, there's a rate based on the median or something like that and, and experience. But that's well, let's let's good take your for them to monitor how badly you drive. I don't want it on me. No, I don't want I don't want my health insurance company monitoring my debit card purchases. Oh well, you ate at Wendy's right. three times last week. Yeah, you know, I think there's a very real scary. But we we need to start wrapping up. So that always leads to the Diner's Guide to DC, and uh, this is where Rob gives us a great spot. So if you visit the nation's capital, and if you haven't, you should because it's an amazing place and very interesting. Uh, when you're, you're, of course, going to get hungry or thirsty. So what, what are some things or some places that people ought to check out when they're in the nation's capital? Well, you know, I, I had not thought about this in advance. I've given you some of my latest ones. But, you know, I, I am next, uh, next week going to one of my favorite bars. It's, it's called Jack Rose. It's a bourbon bar. It's at the bottom of, uh, I think it's 19th Street, 18th, it must be 19, 18th Street. Uh, uh, and Adams Morgan, and they have a bottle of something brown for every year of the last 2,000 some years. So they have 2,020 bottles of whisk of, of brands, 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 not just bottles, brands of whiskey and rye and scotch and all these things. And uh, a funny story about that: I was in New Zealand a couple years ago, uh, and uh, going to a bar with my wife uh, and. Uh, uh, I said, uh, uh, the guy said, where are you from? And I said, uh, from Washington. And, and I said, I'd like something bourbon. And he says, have you heard of, and I said, <laughs> Jack Rose. <laughs> and the answer was yes. <laughs> so that was what he was thinking about. So, so this is a bar. They actually have a really good, um, they have a, a good meal there as well. You can get a good dinner and uh, some great appetizers at the bar. They also have a, a little, uh, they have a, a speakeasy in the basement hmm. where you can pay a, a nice fixed fee and get, I think you buy three drinks and get three drinks and one free. <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's my tip for today, Jack Rose. <laughs> All right, well, thanks for joining us here on The Swamp Rob. It was great to talk to you. Uh, love that we're getting to speak more frequently. It's, and I know the listeners really love these episodes. They get insight that they don't normally get uh, anywhere else, really? Yeah, tell them to uh, follow me on uh, Twitter. Okay, what's your tweet? What's your Twitter handle? Uh, you know, I don't know what my Twitter handle is. <laughs> I'll look it up. I'll put it in the show notes. Look it up. Put it on. <laughs> uh, right. I, uh, I I am starting to, to tweet on a number of things, ranging from the Jones Act to interesting articles on uh, on, new, on physics in the far reaches of the galaxy. So excellent. <laughs> All right. Well, it was a pleasure to talk to you. And thanks to everybody for listening to this episode of We Are Libertarians. We'll uh, talk to you next week.
All right, thanks. Okay, let me stop this.